we like a friendly world, but the connection world, mm. even just a short little one is what I think feeds us, or at least it feeds me. Self-leadership can be lonely. It's hard to do the thing no one else wants to do, that no one else is willing to do. But you are not alone. There are others dancing through the fight and laughing as they lead. Let's find them, swap stories, and live through this together. Welcome to How I Live Through This. I'm your host, Ann Roach, and I'm really glad you're here. I am so excited to welcome my dear friend, Jody Pickering, to the show. How is it possible to describe all that is Jody? She is a lot of things to a lot of people. She's a longtime educator and administrator, currently with AmeriCorps, a mother to an amazing young woman, a sister, a great friend, and one of the most positive people I know. She is also the person I call when I need to figure out how to say something hard. She is an exceptional listener. She asks questions that get to the heart of an issue within seconds. And she asks questions that look around a corner I didn't know existed and which stand in a truth I could not see. When I thought of undercover coaches, Jody immediately sprang to mind. She's not a professionally trained coach, but she approaches everything with genuine curiosity, kindness, empathy, and the innate ability to make me feel truly seen and heard. And she also skips when she's happy, which is one of the greatest <laughs> joys in my life to witness and always something I try to get her to do. <laughs> Welcome to How I Live Through This, Jody. <laughs> ah, thank you. That is so nice, Anne. What a, what a beautiful statement. I really appreciate it. Um, I particularly like you saying about being seen and heard because I just feel more and more like that's, that's what we all need. Yeah. So thanks. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> oh, I'm thrilled to have you. So I, I, I am, you, of course, you pointed out the, the crux, the, the heart of, of this season, because I got feedback from listeners of season one and two who appreciated the examples of how leaders show up for change, but who felt intimidated or overwhelmed at where to start. And they wanted a small, doable step. And that led to this idea of undercover coaches, people who create space for others to put down fear and step into possibility. And um, making somebody feel seen and heard is a, is a great, small, doable step. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it is. I love, I love that people are asking, how do you do this? Because I think that's like what for so long we're told that this is either a skill you have, you don't. And, um, and more and more, I think people are understanding that it's a skill you learn. So I love that. Yeah. How did you learn it? Um, I got old. <laughs> <laughs> I, lot of, I mean, really part of it, I, but I think, I think it's different for young people today. I think they're learning these skills earlier. I know I was certainly teaching them by the end and I started my teaching career and if you got into trouble, you got a, you know, a reflection, which we thought was like really progressive that you had to stay after school and write a reflection. We didn't just call it detention. Um, but there's no conversation there, right? Now, now teachers are trained in how to do restorative justice. And so that both parties have to talk and they have to listen to each other and um, be seen and heard. So I think part of it is that the times are changing and I was lucky to be um, in a profession where a lot of professional development was afforded to me and I could, um, could take advantage of it, you know, and then, yeah. And then big life issues. You know, I went to therapy with my daughter through high school um, when she was struggling with anorexia and the parents needed to um, learn skills. And so I was taught them in a very formal environment there. Um, you know, I was married to a guy who I wanted to listen to and he didn't talk. <laughs> so I got a lot of practice there. 
<laughs> of trying different things. No, I don't know. So really, a lot of it is is um, just life experience. I, I, okay, I have to ask you, can you give me a takeaway from the what you learned with your daughter and then what you learned <laughs> with your ex-husband? Sure. Well, um, okay, okay, yeah. So one is... Um, the, the three most important phrases or three most important words you can use are tell me more. Um, and it's just amazing. Like, so that was from, I think, working with Sophie and um, with her, her therapist. And they were saying, just so everything down, she wasn't really allowed to do anything. She was angry. So just here and there, tell me more. And she wasn't going to, she was, it's, you know, anorexia is a really private thing. And, and um, at that point, she wasn't able to, but it became a pattern. And then I just saw, I used it in my, in my regular life. And um, around the same time, I had a student who was really struggling and his name was Lucas. And I just can remember one day, like just, he was just talking about his frustrated feelings. I just said, tell me more. And he ended up confiding that he was a girl. And um, and so then I started calling Lucas L. And then L, you know, transitioned in eighth grade and is now Lacey. And um, actually it was just on an ESPN Title IX video because she's one of the top girl gamers in the country. So... Uh, you know, those three words are super, super powerful, but they're also just really fun. I realized I was like for so long, I would, um, for a long time, I think as the youngest, I would, uh, talk about me all the time. Right. And here I am talking about me. So it's kind of ironic there, but um, at any time somebody said something, I'd be like, but me, 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 you know, pay attention yeah. to me. And I had lots, I wanted that attention. And then as I got older, it was, I think, my way of connecting or trying to. So that if somebody said something, I wanted to say, oh, yeah, I can connect to that. I have this too. And in college, graduated from college, and my closest, my college roommate and I drove to Texas um, to where my parents lived, and then we were driving to D.C. to move. And while we were in Texas, I discovered a, like a letter she was writing to another one of our friends about how tired she was of hearing me talk about myself. I shouldn't have been oh. reading that letter. <laughs> <laughs> it was like the best thing that could have ever happened to me. It was horrible. It was so painful. I was so angry. And then we had, I told her and we had to drive to DC together. Oh, and, God. Um, but uh, we're still good friends. And, and I just, I catch myself all the time, but I didn't until I found the, those words tell me more or, how to ask questions more. Um, I didn't have the skills to connect. And that's what it really was about was mm -hmm. connect. I didn't really care about sharing my story. And it's way more interesting to listen to somebody else's. Oh my God. I love that. Okay. You, you brought up how to ask better questions. Can you, can you go there? Can you tell us that? Um, how to ask better questions? Yes. I don't know if I have an easy answer there. I mean, if you can ever get trained in clearness committees, like Quaker schools and Quaker <laughs> education, the idea there is if you have a hard decision to make, you get a group of people together and all they do is ask questions and you answer them and then they reflect back what they hear. Um, and the idea being you're going to listen to your own inner teacher to make the decision. So I saw people asking a lot of questions and I asked and I saw the power of that. Um, I have to just oh, if I'm good at it. Yeah, jump in. Yeah, I have to jump in there because that is how I was trained as a coach. And what I notice a lot is that when people ask questions, they often ask questions with an answer. It's a it's an answer hidden as a question. <laughs> I am guilty of this myself. Like, what if you yes. <laughs> how would it yeah. feel to um right. exactly. yeah or um have you tried to and then i give my solution that's the yes. other thing is oftentimes people's questions are solution based or or responses to um mm -hmm. uh you know a, a problem are solution based 
Yeah. And I love that idea of truly asking questions to get at the heart of what the problem is. Yes. Or not even the problem, just to get to, sometimes it's just to get to the feeling. Um, you know, I did a clearness committee um, right after my daughter went to college and then my husband decided he didn't want to be married anymore. And I had been in my school for 12 years. And um, so what do I'm going to do next? And um, I, so I did one about what I was going to quit my job and I was going to join AmeriCorps and do a year of service and uh, just kept finding myself whenever anybody asked me a question about the school, I was kept crying really hard. And by the end, I was like, I know I'm crying because I'm saying goodbye to this place. I'm just ready. Um, but it wasn't, I didn't need an answer. I just, I needed the feeling. So I think, um, I don't know what the questions are, but I do think you can get trained as you're talking about <laughs> as a coach, <laughs> the way you asked them. Yeah, but what what you're, ref- what, I, what, what you're saying, what I'm hearing you say is that it's less about the questions and more about hearing your own reactions to them the feelings, Mm -hmm. the emotions, what's coming up? Well, no, I mean, yes. And I mean, that's what I needed from it. But I think the the skill part, the listening part was, was about the questions. And it was about, I remember one person said um, something, you know, do you, do you feel when you think about both options, do you feel regret at all? And, um, and that was a helpful question. So I do think the way people craft it, but it's, yeah, it's crafting it around. It's not with an answer. They don't want to, yeah. they don't want to give you advice. Who did you ask to do that with you? Uh, other teachers from the school. Yeah. yeah. But I always, I, I envision, I had a friend the other day and I said, you know, we can get a group of people together. It would be cool if yeah. people just did it on their own. I love that idea. Cause there yeah. are p- people in one's life, I'm assuming this is a general truth for most people who who do ask good questions or who who can who can ask you can ask you something that isn't about them. Mm-hmm. And you know, just having sort of like a, a board of directors or a what is it called, you said? A clearness committee. A clearness committee. That is how do you clear, clear the way for what is truly important? That's brilliant. Oh, I love it. So that's part of that. I mean, that's, that's the Quakers. <laughs> they know what's going on. Yeah. yeah they were, they were here before um, coaching. That's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> Can you give me a tip on how to, how to ask questions to somebody who doesn't want to talk? <laughs> I, I got a, I got a person. You are so good at getting people to talk. Uh, you are so awesome at it. I can't imagine. So, some um, people, some people, <laughs> some people really don't want to talk. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hold on. I'm sorry. I'm going to interrupt myself there because I'm recognizing as I'm even saying that, that the reason some people don't want to talk is because they feel very vulnerable and, mm-hmm. and sharing oneself and making a mistake or feeling like you, you're saying something that might sound different than the way you intended it to, or that you say something that might feel like a mistake or, you know, that can be very vulnerable for people. And so um, I'm going to just, I I appreciate you even saying that because it's given me the the recognition that, you know, people are hungry for connection, but that might stand in their way of, of connecting, being open, being vulnerable. I think that's true. And, you know, I think you can, um, for people who are, who are more reticent, this is like, this is, I, you know, you do it with toddlers, but I think you can do it all the way through adults. It's the either or question, right? Like you've got to get clean. Do you want to um, wash your hands in this sink or that sink so that they feel <laughs> independent and can make a decision? Um, and if you're with someone who's particularly reticent, um, you know, I think sometimes you can say things like, do you want me to ans- ask you any questions? Do you want to sit in silence? Do you want to, um, you can go ahead and, or I don't know. I don't, I don't meet a lot of reticent people really. I, you know, I, there are definitely people who are more comfortable in groups, more comfortable, but yeah, I do find one-on-one. Most everybody has something to say. 
like, you know, it's just creating the space for it. Yes, which you do so well. <laughs> I don't know. And then, all right, I'm going to share another. This isn't really the same. Somebody has to talk for this to happen. But another thing I learned was that, and you do this all the time, um, is when you say, like, it's kind of checking back, right? Like, what I heard you say is this. Is that right? Um, and that's so useful. And so I was walking. I, I pick up one of this student friend of mine. I pick her up every Thursday. And she just switched schools. And so for the first time, she's in a school that's predominantly white. She's black. And um, the administrators are white. She's feeling mad at everybody. Um, and so I can't remember exactly what I said, but I said something like, it sounds to me like you're feeling this. And she was like, no, I'm not. <laughs> and then <laughs> she went on and on. And so then when I could say again, oh, so are you really just feeling this? And then she was like, yes, and relaxed. And then our conversation shifted and we could just talk and discuss. But that's a technique that I did not have when I was starting teaching and um, could have been, like, I don't know. I don't even know. You probably know this, but I was sued for like three years when I um, was dean of students in Pennsylvania by this angry family. And I think if I had had, not just me, me, the whole school, but if I had had um, that, even just that skill of mm. during our meetings, being able to sum it up. And I find with like unhappy people um, or frustrated people, it really helps always to sum up in threes um, because then they feel like you're really listening closely. It also helps me because I have attention issues. So if I'm sitting there and I'm mm -hmm. saying, I have to say three things back to this person, it helps me mm -hmm. pay attention more. Yeah. Um, and so I'll say like, okay, it sounds like you're frustrated by the requirement that, you know, they have to, you know, hand in on Google Classroom, and then you're also feeling like it's hard to talk about it, and then you're feeling like I'm not very approachable. It's you know, whatever it is, those having threes is kind of magic when people are unhappy. I don't know. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, that. It, so I do do that a lot, except I do have to pay careful attention to. I think the the piece that you added at the end, is that accurate? Asking, you know, is that accurate? Because I find, and I find this as a coach too, um, I, you know, <laughs> well, it's, I find this as all of the things that I am, a former attorney, somebody who, you know, is always <laughs> looking for a solution, you know, uh, like I am fast, I'm efficient, I wanna get to the, you know, the, the answer. It's kind of my former self, which is sometimes at war with my current self, which is, you know, exploration mm -hmm. and open and um, it's not about me. And so that, um, you know, that tension between being right and saying, OK, we got it. Now let's move forward versus here's what I'm hearing from you. How accurate is that? So that right. it really is a true reflection that's a gift to the speaker because they can hear what they're saying and whether that matches up with what they're feeling. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really powerful. And when somebody does it to me, you know, I just, again, it goes back to the way we started. You feel really seen and heard. Like yeah. even if they're getting it wrong, you're like, Oh, but you're in it with me. Oh uh, yeah. That's good. Uh, yeah. That's really good. I get kind of I get kind of pissy when I hear somebody say, You sound really something and it doesn't feel right at all. Mm -hmm. And I I sometimes get well, I never like to be put in a box. So I so I am I'm the worst person to coach because I'm always like, yeah, you know, I'm like water. I'm trying to find the way out. <laughs> Coaches but there's something in what clients. you just said. You saw what you just said, and that's the word you sound. I don't know. Mm. There's something. It's like telling someone they look tired or whatever. You, yes. you sound this way. It's just like, no, I don't. Like, I don't want to ever listen to this podcast because I want to hear my voice. You know, like, <laughs> I want you to tell me how I sound. Oh, I love I that it. distinction. 
I don't know what, but I, I, I'm trying to think of what I, what I hear you saying is, or, oh no, not you sound. What I usually say is it sounds, Yeah. right? It sounds like you're unhappy. That's very different to me sounding than saying you sound unhappy. Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. Jody. I don't know why it feels really different, but it does. But I, I you live, you pick that up. That's brilliant. Ah, but you know, it's okay. This is also brilliant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then we have to do a PSA on just for everybody, the general public's understanding. Never, ever, 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 under any circumstances, ever tell somebody they look tired. Ever. Yes. Ever. Ever. Just ever. never, ever. Ever, ever, ever. It's a, it's a like, shit thing to hear. Always. <laughs> you know. And it's not even, it, it's not even really great to say, are you all right? <laughs> Just say, how are you doing today? Yeah. Let them come clean or not. Right. Somebody has big bags under their eyes because they're having yeah. menopause and sweats at night. They, they know they know like yeah. shit. <laughs> or they didn't know. And why are you bringing them down? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. I didn't look feel tired. No, I do. <laughs> I'm annoyed. No, not yeah, only am I tired, I, I, I know I look <laughs> terrible. Thanks. <laughs> sorry, that was oh, a sidetrack. No, no, that's all right. Actually, your sorry is a good segue because I don't know what you said that made me think, but I'm thinking about how um, the things that got in the way uh, in my marriage early on, which I thought we had kind of overcome, but we so clearly didn't. We just, you know, instead of talking, buried things. But it was the sorry, but, mm. uh, and you know, when there any sort of conflict or something, um, I could apologize. Um, actually even that took me a long time. My family was not a big apology, big into apologies, but, um, I learned to apologize. And then I always, and it's still pretty recently and probably still do would need to say, but I was just trying to do this. Right. I was just trying to do that, um, which just totally negates, you know, the apology. And yet I kept wrestling with it because I was like, but there's still something there. It's not just like I'm not trying to negate. I'm trying to communicate and like continue the conversation and how can we kind of learn from it. And, you know, it really pisses my daughter off when I would do it. So I, at one point I just said to her, um, and I think someone taught me this. I don't think I made it up, but you know, I'm really sorry. And, uh, if you want an explanation of what I was thinking, let me know. Mm -hmm. Um, and then she was like, Oh yeah, sure. I'll hear what you were thinking. And she wasn't on the side or whatever. And then we had a whole conversation and it just took the edge off. Mm -hmm. So something about that allows people to listen if, you know, it's not sorry, but, but there, there's always more that, that maybe should be talked about. Anyways, I'm not really sure that it's about listening, but I like it. <laughs> well, but listening and being heard, because there is this, mm -hmm. there is this, you know, part, part of what's come up when I've talked to people about listening and creating space for other people is, and I keep hearing this, yeah, and I also don't want to just listen to people because some people need to hear me. And, mm -hmm. you know, I create space a lot for people who, who take up a lot of space and who talk a lot. And, um, you know, I don't feel like they are listening to anybody else. So part of that creating space is also if you can create space for someone to put down fear, they're much more willing to be open to something that they weren't before. I think you're right. And, and you're making me wonder, like, what do you say to people who say like, well, nobody, you know, like, they never ask me questions about myself. You know what I'm talking about there? That it's like, oh, you know, I hate going to visit my family because they never ask me about my life or how I am. And, and that's kind of what I'm hearing you say about how I create all this space or I ask questions and then it's not reciprocated. Hmm. Yeah. I used to be one of those people. 
who said nobody, nobody <laughs> ever asks me anything about Well, they myself. still don't because you just listen. <laughs> Well, it was one of the things I resisted about being a coach. I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to just talk, you know, I just don't, I don't want to hear just about other people. I also want to, you know, I had so much ego. I wanted to be Mm -hmm. part of the conversation. And, and I, you know, I can only speak from my own experience. Um, You know, when I was a, when I was a lawyer, no, nobody in my family ever asked me about my work. (laughs) (laughs) That's crazy because it was so interesting. Yeah, but I think part of it was really, I was on fire and I, you know, I showed up Mm -hmm. in a really, you know, um, kind of forceful way. And Mm -hmm. it was a lot for people. It was really Mm -hmm. intense. You know, I was on fire. I wanted to talk about the injustice all the time. I wanted to talk Mm -hmm. about what people faced all the time. And I was calling it out, you know, and that's hard for people. Maybe people didn't want to hear that. Like, you know, that's, that's whatever that experience is for other people. That was not something that they were asking me a lot of questions about. And so, um, I, you know, taking this way back, I was always like, why, do, why doesn't anybody ever want to ask me anything? <laughs> you know, as a coach, the way I show up when I went through coach training, it changed how I show up in the world. And so those conversations are, I can have more now of the, those kinds of conversations because I create space for more people to come in and I don't Mm -hmm. just show up lighting, lighting it up, you know, sometimes sometimes that's necessary, but you need to be able to read the room. (laughs) Right. So it wasn't necessarily just the content that was hard for the discussion. It was the way you were delivering it. A thousand percent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's the other thing is, you know, when, when I say something to somebody expecting an outcome, or I say, or I want to talk about myself because, or I want to talk about something because I have an outcome. I'm waiting for a specific response, or I want to feel a certain way about how something I'm saying is received. But 90% of the time I'm disappointed. Mm-hmm. And so, mm-hmm. you know, part, so this is, as, as we're talking about this, it really comes back to the awareness of what it is you're mm-hmm. saying, how you're saying it, why you're saying something and why you want people to listen to you. You know, is it because you want to feel connected? Then say that if, if it's because you feel afraid that you're, you're no one's listening anymore, or, you know, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't have a voice in this anymore. I know. And this is the hard part. You know, this is, I'm sort of dancing around it, but I'll go right to it. There are a lot of people who, didn't realize they had a microphone for a long time. And now they're being asked to step back from the microphone. Oh, yeah. And they're feeling a little like, wait a second, right. I, does this mean I, I have to mute myself? You know, a lot of right. people are feeling like that dial is being turned on and down on them. Right. And they didn't ask for that. And so, you know, there is this, well, wait a second, don't I get a chance to talk anymore? How come everybody else now gets to talk? And I don't get a right. chance to talk. Now, we can debate that. But it's a true feeling for a lot of people. What I liked is what you were saying there is, is really figuring out why you want to talk. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that you, you said in a couple different ways. You said, when I'm looking for an outcome, um, then I'm, I'm disappointed. And I think back about times where, like, I was proud of something. And so I share it because I'm, I'm, uh, but I was looking for affirmation of yeah. y- you should be proud or I'm proud of you back. Yes. Um, and, and yeah, 95% disappointed. But if you could say like, Hey, I'm really proud of something. Can I share with you? Like, but then like they're, they're know what they're, they're looking for. Yeah. And what you're doing is you're saying, I want to yeah share it. So those people who are anybody who's worried about, Hey, your voice is being tamped down. I think it's just a question of like, well, what am I, what am I feeling the need is, is that feeling like then I don't connect to people? Well, then how do I connect? Yeah. I listen. And, and say, yeah, listen, and also <laughs> saying what you're feeling, like actually you're, you're 
Uh, I know we're only using the audio here, but your whole face changed when you said, I'm really proud of something. Can I share it with you? Like you lit up and you know, there is, it's hard for some people, but I think saying, I'm really afraid of something. Can I share that with you? Or I'm really excited about something. Can I share that with you? Because then it is not necessarily you're not just conveying information. You're really talking about feelings and what, Ever you are feeling, whatever you are feeling, you can guarantee if you name it, somebody else has stood in that same current. And that's mm-hmm. how you connect to somebody else. I love that. I love that you particularly use current there since you described yourself as water early. Mm-hmm. You're a really good listener. <laughs> that's interesting. That's interesting. But I am also imagining myself every day coming home. <laughs> somebody going I'm really proud can I tell you something (laughs) I suppose there has to be space for it I mean that's the thing it was I was thinking about some of these phrases as when you told me you wanted to do the podcast and I was like okay what are some of the things that I've learned that I now use naturally and and don't feel stilted because I think some people are so resistant to using specific language right but but I was trying to imagine, it, like, it's ridiculous that the, the, the check cashier person at my local supermarket says, how you doing <laughs> every time to me? Like, she does not want to know how I'm doing, really. Every now and then I answer in a real way, but, like, it's just perfunctory. But I was trying to imagine if I just showed up and she didn't say anything and we just exchanged it. It would be a totally different, uncomfortable vibe. Yeah. And so I feel like, and that doesn't even... I don't know. That's not even really inspiring true connection, but it has some connection. So if you can ask, if you can say something like, tell me more, Mm -hmm. just because you learn that phrase and all of a sudden it opens up a bunch of doors, we shouldn't feel embarrassed about using it. It Well, here's my example of the, the, how you doing? I want to live in a place where people say hi to each other. I want to live in a place where I, we smile at each other. So I do that. And I never pay attention to whether somebody smiles back or says hello, because that's not the point. If I want to live in a place where people say hello, then I say hello. And bam, I live in a place where people say hello. (laughs) Even if it's just me. (laughs) I am so glad you said this because my student friend and I always says, She's like, Miss Jody, you are too friendly. You like, just, <laughs> I'm going to take that phrasing. I'm going to spat it out next time she says that. Because it's yes. not about That's the right. outcome. I, right. There's no validation I need from other people who who smile back. Maybe you didn't see me. Maybe you don't feel like it. Maybe like it has happened to me. You're somebody close to you has just died and you just are like in your own head. Or maybe you're going through your own shit and, and you don't feel like smiling. That's not the point. The point is I want to live in a world where people are friendly. So I'm friendly and I live in a world where people are friendly. It's my own world. And, you know, you get a smile back. That's great. But that's not that's not the point. No. And but you're extending that whole way of being to your life. You want to live in a world where people listen. And so you listen. You want to live in a world where people like make share good ideas so you're creating this podcast you want to live in a people like that's just how you live your life you just do what you want to see and that cashier is lives in a world where people care and ask how are you doing and sometimes you know like she's asking that you know that's for her maybe more Mm -hmm. for her than it is for you yeah maybe i really could talk to you for for hours more but I just want to be thoughtful of your time and ask, you know, as we've been talking about this and thinking about your, you said, you said at the very beginning, uh, when I asked, how did you learn this? And you said, I've grown up. (laughs) And, (laughs) And so through your years of growing and learning, what have you discovered about yourself or, or others in, in, connecting listening and connecting life is more fun connecting um i think 
I just love, I love the way people will open up to you. And I love, um, I just love how even, you know, a, a random connection, you know, standing in line somewhere or watching a sporting event and you're in a seat next to a stranger and then you connect. And if you ask the right question, you end up having kind of, I don't know, a legit conversation. And, and during COVID they studied this, some, right. And I forget what they called it. They call it casual connections. They were saying like, that was kind of the, it wasn't that people were losing their close friendships. They'll talk on the phone. Like we'll finish this conversation here. We know we'll talk for hours again, another mm-hmm. time. Like that's, but it was the kind of daily interactions, these kind of casual collisions. I forget what they call them, but it's mm-hmm. like just that you collide with people and you know, we want it more to be that hi, hi, we like a friendly world or the goodbye, goodbye. We like a friendly world, but the connection world, mm-hmm. even just a short little one is what I think feeds us, or at least it feeds me. So I love that. And mm-hmm. uh, so of course it makes me wonder if you have a connection question that you ask people, but also I think people are, so I, so te- p- put a pin on that one. Cause I want to know that, but also mm-hmm. people are afraid to, to make the first move there are people who are afraid to make the first move. It feels too vulnerable or they're worried everyone is angry and they don't want to be, you know, they don't want to get, they don't want to be misunderstood or get kind of, um, you know, shouted at. Do you have a question that you ask? What's your advice there? I don't have a question because usually what I ask, I'm genuinely curious about. (laughs) What do you want listeners to take away from this conversation? Hmm. That it's a, that it's, I think it can be learned if you feel like, and I, I would say for a lot of my life, I was not a good listener. And I think I even resisted people telling me I was a good listener. But then when you realize, oh, wait, there's people who call you to talk about things. They must <laughs> like talking to you. I think you listen. But um, yeah. And, and so I think, you know, you can read books about it. That's took courses on empathetic listening for my job and it's a skill it's not something you're born with and I think if you think you don't like listening which I didn't because I was so easily distracted um but that also you'll find that you do that's awesome awesome well I have to say I'm I'm kind of relieved to hear that you were not you consider yourself not a good listener for most of your life because I feel the same way about myself, but I would have never guessed that from you. So <laughs> it gives me hope that yeah. I'm not alone. <laughs> it's because you didn't ask me the right questions. <laughs> I know. Well, it is it's true. We've talked about a lot of stuff and I'm still discovering stuff about you. So it's because you usually ask me more questions than I ask you. <laughs> oh, hush. we take turns. We take turns. All right. Well, thank you you so much, Jenny. It's been awesome to be here. Thank you. I love you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Season 3 Undercover Coaches. This season was born from the idea that you don't have to be a coach or trained in coaching skills to move the needle. People in my audience were saying, your guests are amazing, but I don't have these coaching or leadership skills. I can't do that work because I don't know how to. What if I get it wrong or make a mistake? I feel exactly the same way every goddamn day. And I'm calling bullshit on both of us. Creating a connection, stepping into possibility can be as simple as a conversation or even a smaller step, listening before responding. What's one thing you heard in this conversation that you can put into practice? Start with someone you know if that's easier, and then once you get comfortable, try it on someone you don't. Keep practicing. That's the work. I'll be right here beside you doing the same thing. After all, we're living through this together.